Muchas gracias, muy buenas tardes. Mi saludo a todas las autoridades presentes. Vamos a hablar brevemente de Paraguay, un país ubicado en el corazón de América del Sur. Ustedes podrán ver en esta transparencia. Paraguay está ubicado en el mismo corazón de América, representa una porción muy pequeña del continente latinoamericano, con Uruguay probablemente y Bolivia somos los países más pequeños de la región, pero unidos, presidente de Sanguinetti, podemos enfrentarle a los más poderosos que nos rodean, Brasil y Argentina. Esta lámina pretende informar la presión tributaria económicamente que ejercen los continentes. Como ustedes pueden ver, la comunidad europea con un porcentaje muy alto, Asia, América Latina, es muy pequeña su injerencia, apenas del 3,3 al 4,3%. Y Paraguay con Uruguay, que somos los países más pequeños, otra vez representamos una presión muy pequeña dentro de la economía mundial. <coughs> ¿Por qué es importante la relación, sobre todo, con Asia? Porque Paraguay ocupa el mismo centro del corredor bioceánico. La forma de unir los dos océanos, el Atlántico y el Pacífico, se da en gran medida por el paso necesario a través de la República del Paraguay. En ese sentido, la, el comercio que podamos tener entre América Latina y Asia, sobre todo del Atlántico hacia el Pacífico, pasa necesariamente por Paraguay. En el contexto regional, ahí ustedes pueden ubicar fácilmente la hidrovía Paraguay-Paraná, eso que está en azul, lo que vieron en amarillo son la red rodoviaria y finalmente en rojo la red ferroviaria. Es muy importante, sobre todo teniendo en cuenta la industria que tenemos actualmente en Corea, una industria muy floreciente con gran posibilidad de inversión en nuestro país, específicamente en Paraguay, en donde tenemos el cuarto lugar como país exportador de soja, sexto lugar exportador de carne, quinto país exportador de trigo, primer país exportador de azúcar orgánica a nivel mundial, y es un país con un bono demográfico muy alto. 70% de la población en el Paraguay tiene menos de 30 años de edad. Esa situación de por sí le convierte al Paraguay en un país seductor, un país atractivo para la inversión internacional. Y por supuesto, esto se hace a través de una planificación estratégica del IRSA, en donde 12 países están nucleados en una iniciativa para la infraestructura regional, haciendo que las obras a uno y otro lado de las respectivas fronteras sean armónicas y proporcionales entre nuestros países. Con esta transparencia pretendemos comunicar a este digno auditorio las obras que se están llevando adelante dentro de América, algunas de ellas lejos del ejido regional del Mercosur, donde Paraguay y Uruguay formamos parte, pero voy a referirme en particular a aquello que guarda en relación al Paraguay, su hidrovía, Paraguay-Paraná, que con mucho es la vía de comunicación más importante que tiene el Paraguay, siendo un país mediterráneo. Los ríos Paraguay y Paraná permiten llevar y traer las mercaderías del mundo hacia y desde el Paraguay. Con esta proyección ustedes pueden visualizar esto que está, es el mapa de la República del Paraguay, Ahí tenemos las obras que queremos realizar. Yo me comprometí en una reunión donde tuvimos recién con un grupo de empresarios coreanos que iba a dejar esta transparencia para los empresarios que estén interesados en ir a invertir en el Paraguay. Ahí pueden ver todas las posibilidades de inversión. Corea ya prácticamente no tiene nada que realizar, tiene todo realizado. En el Paraguay está todo por realizarse. Es un país próspero, un país con muchas ganas de ir adelante, en donde necesitamos la inversión, sobre todo de nuestros hermanos coreanos. En un pequeño corte comercial, quiero recordar que en los años 65 al 75, Paraguay recibió a más de 140 mil ciudadanos coreanos, que cuando era inminente la guerra entre Corea del Norte y Corea del Sur, fueron al Paraguay y hasta hoy muchos de ellos se quedaron a vivir por la hospitalidad del pueblo paraguayo. Vamos a referirnos fundamentalmente a los proyectos que guardan relación. Ahí ustedes pueden ver los proyectos con la financiación, los países que están afectados. 
El corredor bioceánico que une el Atlántico con el Pacífico es fundamental y, por supuesto, la red rodoviaria y ferroviaria que pueda unir. Esta es la imagen que se genera en Paraguay cuando tenemos zafra, cuando tenemos cosecha, perdón, de soja, de trigo, y esta situación mejora necesariamente con la implementación de un sistema rodoviario que permita cambiar esa imagen que recién estuvimos viendo por una imagen mucho más atractiva, una imagen mucho más seductora, que permita cambiar la imagen que tenemos como país de la gran cantidad de vehículos que llevan carga respecto a, los, a, a un sistema ferroviario en el cual puedan organizarse y llevarse los productos en forma mucho más armónica. Esta situación cambia, cambiaría, no estoy pudiendo recuperar la imagen, pero no importa, cambiaría con el sistema rodoviario. Se, es urgente en Paraguay la necesidad de un sistema rodoviario que permita llevar más rápido la mercadería desde el Paraguay al mundo. 33 dólares por tonelada pierden competitividad del Paraguay al sacar sus productos desde origen a un puerto de ultramar. Y en ese sentido, la implementación de un sistema rodoviario, sin lugar a duda, va a cambiar sustancialmente la imagen que tenemos como país. En segundo lugar, tenemos el Chaco. El Chaco paraguayo es un territorio vasto que ocupa 62% del territorio. Pero lamentablemente en el Chaco tenemos apenas el 2% de la población del Paraguay. Y ahí quiero con ustedes compartir las reflexiones del reverendo Mum, quien veía en el Paraguay y en el Chaco en particular la brillante oportunidad para poder desarrollar. Decía el reverendo Mum que la mejor manera de frenar la pobreza no era ni destruyendo la producción, ni combatiendo la pobreza en los centros urbanos. La mejor manera de combatir la pobreza era enfrentándolo a la pobreza allí donde se genera, en el lugar más alejado, en el lugar más desolado, en este caso del Paraguay, que sería el Chaco. Y el reverendo Moon entendió que el Chaco era un territorio ideal para poder invertir, llevando la producción de nuestro país, en este caso el Paraguay, como ustedes podrán ver ahí, río Paraguay, río Paraná, tenemos petróleo en el Chaco paraguayo, tenemos la tierra más fértil de la región, en una misma parcela de tierra se cosecha tres veces al año en la zona del Chaco. El presidente Sanguinetti debe conocer que muchos ciudadanos uruguayos, argentinos, brasileros, fueron a invertir en el Paraguay por su gran productividad ganadera, Paraguay tiene hoy la cuarta producción más grande de ganado a nivel mundial. Creo que eso, teniendo una superficie tan pequeña, hace de Paraguay un país atractivo. Esta zona del Chaco paraguayo, donde tenemos la presencia de Puerto Leda y Puerto Victoria, donde el reverendo Moon tiene una propiedad de aproximadamente 700 a 800 mil hectáreas, es apenas el inicio, el preludio de una serie de inversiones que se puede llevar adelante. Finalmente, con esta presentación, para terminar, queremos demostrar la productividad del Chaco paraguayo. Estamos a dos horas de San Pablo, dos horas de Montevideo, de Buenos Aires, de Santiago y de La Paz. Paraguay está en el mismo corazón de América Latina. Y en este momento donde hay inconveniente por la falta de paz, de desarrollo, en el Paraguay, un país cálido, pequeño, es un país interesante para poder llevar adelante la producción. Muchas gracias, paz y bendiciones para cada uno de ustedes. Thank you very much, President Franco, for letting us understand the significance of Paraguay in the Americas and the contribution of Father Moon to the development of Paraguay. So are you enjoying, you're in Korea, but are you enjoying this trip North and South America through our speakers? Yeah? Okay, good, thank you. Thank you very much. So let's go back now to North America. And as you know, in Washington, D.C., there are two newspapers, but the greatest one is called the Washington Times. And yeah, you can clap, please. America's newspaper. And it's a great honor for me 
to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Larry Beasley, who is the president of the Washington Times, and he's here with us. Let's welcome him to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Too, too, too high. Is that good? Okay. Now, thank you. Is that good? Uh, thank you, Congressman. I appreciate very much uh, you calling attention to the booklet. I want to uh, talk, thank Dr. Jenkins and Dr. Uh, Kim for their input on it. Excellent job, thank you very much. I hope everyone takes it home with them, enjoys it, because it was truly a fight against communism. Uh, I want to say that the Washington Times continues to promote the values and vision of our co-founders, and the mission has not changed at all since the time that uh, we started being the conservative watchdog for Washington, D.C., the nation, and the world. Our mission, and our guiding principles and vision are very clear. We've not changed these since the beginning when Father Moon took over, uh, started the Washington Times along with uh, uh, Mrs. Moon. We give thanks and uh, respect to the co-founders, Reverend and Mrs. Moon, and uh, our commitment to investigative journalism and very strong opinion section to advocate what's right and wrong is based on the founder's core values and principles, which we stand for today, freedom, faith, family, and service. I have sincere and deep appreciation for the very strong support Dr. Hak Jamahan Moon has shown towards myself personally, the Washington Times, and the very strong commitment to uh, empower us to create the most effective multimedia, digital, and print organization. And it's a very powerful content that will make us financially strong for the future. Just to give you an example of what we are doing and what our mission is, the Washington Times was close to, I'm sorry, a little ahead of myself, was uh, about $26 million in need of, of financial aid from the parent company in 2012. We expect fully by the end of 2014 to be under $6 million and, and profitable in 2015. We, uh, we think that this is a tremendous achievement and we couldn't do this without the support, of course, Dr. Jenkins, Mother Moon, and many of the board members. And I thank you very much. Let me share with you some key developments, which, um, which I think is very important. I may have gotten ahead of myself here. I apologize if I did. Um, yeah, I'm going to go back the other way. I'm sorry. It jumped. Okay, here we go. Yes, Dr. Ben Carson is one of our key uh, people that have joined the Washington Times in the last year as a columnist, and I think most of you know that he probably will be running on the ticket in 2000, or for the ticket in 2016 for president. Okay. Did I leap forward? General Michael Hayden, of course, was head of the CIA and the NSA uh, for the United States, and uh, he is uh, certainly one of our true and valued conservatives in America and uh, a protector of freedom around the world. And he is a columnist for us, set so many panels for the Washington Times, and along with other big names that's joined the Washington Times recently, and I'll go through this very quickly, but Tom DeLay, former House Majority Leader, Matt Staver, Liberty Dean, uh, University Law Dean, uh, many of the other well-known columnists, but Monica Crowley, who many of you know from Fox News, radio and TV commentator, author of several books. She sits in for the Sean Hannity Show. Every Tuesday night, she's on with Bill O'Reilly. She is our online opinion editor. Uh, she came to work for us about three months ago, and we, uh, we think that it's fantastic that she's joined an organization like the, column, like the Washington Times to lead us into the digital age as well. Uh, I want to mention that our newsroom, has kept, uh, this goes along with our content and what we need to do to become uh, profitable and, and self-sustaining financial for the future. 
We captured more uh, awards this past year than any time that we can um, uh, remember in Washington Times history. And these were very significant, even all along to uh, a few years ago, the sports section of the Washington Times disappeared. We brought it back. And this past year, our sports editor won the sports uh, editor of the uh, Sports Writers Association Editor of the Year for all of the, uh, North America. We, we do a lot for special, in special sections. We just came out with a fantastic one on Israel. We're doing one on drones, Nigeria, another one for Israel, Russia, and immigration. Our national organization for marriage on marriage uh, just a couple of months ago was just absolutely spectacular in the Washington, D.C. area and online around the country. It's very important to what we stand for. The National Rifle Association is a great partner with us. We're doing a constitution section uh, next month. It's going to be spectacular. And these are the things that sets Washington Times apart from the rest of the media. Uh, we've got a newly designed Washington Times website. I hope all of you go to it. You probably heard in February and before when we would kept talking about go to Washington, www.washingtontimes.com. It's more important than ever to continue going to that website to help us grow page views. And you'll see a, a new designed website that's very user friendly. Our comments uh, right now are just, uh, just surpass, surpassing all of our expectations. Thursday alone of this last week, we had 1.4 million page views in the very slowest time of the year with uh, Congress being gone for five weeks. Some folks think that they're gone a lot longer than that most of the year, but uh, <laughs> We are reaching new levels with our, with our digital site, so we're very happy. Our national digital edition, which I've talked to many of you about, that uh, has launched, and uh, our new app is, is, is uh, in the store. It's $39.95 a year, and it's just a spectacular seven-day-a-week digital program. One thing that's very key to us are, are videos online. Many of you, I think, quite often go to your website and you click onto a video. A year ago, we had about 120,000 videos a month. Now we're averaging well over 3 million. In June, when we had 4 million. Last month, we had about 3.2 million. So these, this is just a great new revenue source for us, and it creates more page views and people are reading the websites longer. Our partnership with the Washington Redskins, which is one of the most dynamic franchises in, in North America, is a partner with us here, this year for the first time ever. It's going to mean quite a bit of revenue for us in the future and continue our, our road to pro towards profitability. I thank you for your time and appreciate you going to WashingtonTimes.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for helping us to understand again the significance of the media and the great vision the Father and Mother Moon had for the Washington Times to serve America. So, I want to know if you were listening carefully or not. What is the website? www.washingtontimes.com. So if you're in Africa, in Asia, Latin America, Oceania, uh, the Caribbean, you can watch. So let's thank one more time the president of the Washington Times, Tom Bursley. Thank you. So, uh, this session we had to balance from the previous one. There were four ladies and two men, right? So this one we, we're trying to cover up for that one. So representing all of you distinguished ladies who are in the audience, we have here Mrs. Alexa Ward, who is the International Vice President of the Women's Federation for World Peace. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Mrs. Alexa Ward. Hello. I was looking over the audience and I thought, wow, I'm very impressed. For many of us, it's somewhere between, what, 3 and 4 a.m. of another night and you were, I think I was yawning more than anyone. You look bright and everyone looks rested, so you're doing very well with this kind of time change. It's not easy. <clears throat> so I've been a unificationist for more than three decades and I've been involved with the women's peace movement in um, our movement for about 20 years, and I have a very special opportunity today to 
this afternoon to take, give you a very different kind of presentation. And that is we're going to try and cover uh, Father and Mother Moon's life, legacy, contribution in North America, about 49 years worth of investment in about 12 minutes. So you really have to be very alert for this one. This is a story of dedication, love, determination, and investment. And really, it's my privilege and honor and pleasure to share this with you. <clears throat> so we're going to cover a lot of ground. Ricardo, why do you go up? Which one do I press? Which one? Just enter? No. That one. OK. Go back one. Just go back one. Oh, woo. Thank you. OK. So Father Moon first came to America in 1965. At that time, he blessed the land. He created and established 55 holy grounds in 43 days across the country. Next, he returned in 1969 with his wife, and he blessed couples. Blessing couple, blessed couples, which is the foundation of blessed central families, is at the heart of their mission worldwide. It's through the blessing that men and women cultivate themselves with the heart of a parent, first in their own families and later on higher levels for the sake of the nation and the world. So actually, I'm just going to go through slides of blessing ceremonies that have taken place over the past 30 years. And you'll see that this is a very substantial foundation You'll see friends and family in those pictures. <clears throat> in 1971, he returned with his family and settled in the United States. Father Moon came to America to waken this nation to its God-given responsibility for the sake of the world. In a period of just 200 years, the US has been blessed with a strong economic foundation, freedom of thought, freedom of religion, among others. Father Moon stayed in the U.S. for many decades to help the United States fulfill its responsibility. Father Moon said that 1972 to 1974 were very important years in America's history. He reached out to the highest levels of leadership and encouraged members to both witness and grow the church. He and his wife conducted many speaking tours. Actually, I like this picture because many times on their speaking tours, where did they eat? They ate at McDonald's. He conducted seven city speaking tours, 21 city speaking tours, 32 city tours, followed by Madison Square Garden, uh, Yankee Stadium, Washington Monument. On the foundation, I'm sorry, in the midst of this, the Watergate crisis arose and he took a very public stand. Between 1972 and 1974, Father Moon became known to every American. There's Father Moon with President Nixon. Madison Square Garden, 1974. Yankee Stadium, 1976. You can see the numbers, huge crowds coming to hear his message. Institution building. On the foundation of these speaking tours, Father Moon began a period of institution building. The Unification Church was founded in the US in 1961 under the name of the Holy Spirit Association for the unification of world Christianity. <clears throat> this was, an, it was for many years our national church headquarters in Manhattan, a beautiful building 40, on West 43rd Street between 5th and 6th Avenues. 1972, he founded the International Conference in the Unity of the Sciences, <clears throat> UTS, Unification Theological Seminary, 1975. Father Moon taught there, but also this is where he introduced his followers to one of his great loves, which was fishing. Taught them how to make nets, how to catch the fish in the nearby lagoon. UTS is right on the banks of the Hudson River in the, in the uh, Hudson Valley of New York. <clears throat> 1976, the New Yorker Hotel. We're pleased to have the current president with us, Ann Peterson of the New Yorker Hotel. I love this photo. This is where the Moon family is standing at the top of the building, 40 stories up giving it its blessing just after it was purchased. <clears throat> we saw this picture in your book, the Washington Times. This is 
part of the foundations of News World Communications, CAUSA International, 1980, the Washington Times Building, Tears of Heaven, 1984, the Moon family uh, had a personal tragedy and lost one son in a car accident in the United States. And that same year, Father Moon went to Danbury Prison uh, for, uh, for an indictment on tax evasion. Sorry, I'm losing my script here a little bit. In the midst of this growth, there was controversy and growing organized resistance to the movement from some parents, an organization called the Cult Awareness Network, some political individuals, the media, and the far left. Father Moon was indicted on charges of income tax evasion. He was actually the first person in America's history to be indicted for the very first tax form he completed in the U.S. He served time in a federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut for a period of 13 months. By the time he came out of Danbury, he was organizing the movement on new and higher levels. The University of Bridgeport, we became involved with the University of Bridgeport in 1992. The Women's Federation for World Peace was founded in 1992. Uh, Mother Moon spoke in the United Nations 1993. Family Federation for World Peace and Unification, 1993. The International Friendship Conferences, these were uh, actually over a two year period. Uh, this conference was held monthly in eight cities and at the 50 year commemoration of the end of World War II and <clears throat> threw it 20,000 pairs of Japanese and American sisters were created. That's President Bush, the First Lady, Barbara Bush and two of the presidents at that time of WWP, Nora Spurgeon and Motoko Sugiyama. Here's Mother Moon with President and Mrs. Bush. Coretta Scott King was involved in this series, the wife of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Father Moon speaking in a tour in Canada, 1998, Blessed, family and, Blessed Marriage and Family Life Speaking Tour. 2000, the founding of ACLC, the American Clergy Leadership Conference, which has developed into a major organization in the US uh, that involves bringing together people of different faiths. 50 states speaking tour, 2001. We will stand resolution, part of that. 2001, September 11th, Father Moon was so concerned about uh, the attack on 9-11 uh, and, and especially about the foundation um, being damaged of trying to bring religions together to, to work together and understand one another. 2003, the Middle East Peace Initiative was founded. 2004, the Crown of Peace Ceremony. This ceremony was a time when Father and Moon really, and Mother Moon wanted to share with Americans what it meant to be a prince and princess of God by showing the way themselves and encouraging all of us to become those kind of people. 2005, the founding of the Universal Peace Federation. 2006, Mother Moon's World Speaking Tour, 120 Speaking Tour, 120 Clergy Tour. This is just a snapshot overview. As you can imagine, there's a lot more to the story than this, but I wanted to give you a taste of the depth and breadth. 2011, Founders Tour Las Vegas, <clears throat> distributing the autobiography of True Father. This is the last project that Father Moon worked on in the United States at the International Peace Education Center, being built in Las Vegas, being a picture of it being presented by Dr. Keon Kim and Dr. Michael Balcom, who lead the Family Federation in the US. September 2012, as you know, our beloved Father Moon passed, and uh, it was a really beautiful ceremony in Korea. I was able to participate in that with my husband. Honestly, most of us are, weren't ready for it and are still 
trying to come to terms with it on many levels. And we're so grateful for Mother Moon's determination and resolve and love to move the movement forward and really complete Father's life's work. A few months after Father passed, Mother Moon came and spoke in Las Vegas and then conducted a pilgrimage in the United States with her children and visited many of the sites in the U.S. that were very dear to Father Moon. Women's Peace Movement, in our movement we call it the Women's Federation for World Peace. This is the um, uh, inaugural event in the U.S., October 1992. This is Mrs. Lynn Cheney. Coretta Scott King, Maureen Reagan, Doro Bush Cook, uh, Donzele Abernathy, some of the women we've had the privilege of working with over the past uh, 20 years in Women's Federation, Nora Spurgeon, the first president, myself. I love this picture. This is with um, Father Moon in their breakfast room at their home in New York. This breakfast room had a big rock. You can see the rock behind there. The rock came before the house, so the rock's still there. And there's a pool in that room with beautiful carp. So we always love to have breakfast there. 20th uh, anniversary of WWP. This is Angelica Selly, the current president. Nia Light, there you are in the picture. <laughs> Father Moon with one of his grandchildren. True love. This is uh, the God's Hope for America pilgrimage, which actually revisited those 55 holy grounds in 43 days, which I think you'll hear about in a few minutes from Dr. Balcom. And here's one of my favorite pictures, Father and Mother Moon. So thank you very much. It was really a privilege to share this with you.